Staple together, written between John Beckwith and a guy named Eric Sider or something, president of the Chem Company, all written from 1958. Here's original letters from this guy's first interest, and I was so pleased to be able to just give them to him because I understand what that means in collecting. As collectors, we connect to what it is we are interested in. And here in this little moment here, just serendipity turns into a chance for me to explore lasers the way I love it best, sharing what you know it's all about in a way where it makes somebody's day. And you're looking at my day being made over and over and over again to where every piece has a story. And I'm sure it's the same with all you guys, too, because you look at your lighters and every story comes from every piece. It brings back a memory of a time, a place, people, where, how things happen. And I can remember pretty much every damn story. I don't know how we do that. But our collections are that. It's sort of like this reference library of our past experiences. And so this collection is sort of based on that. This is a Dolbereiner clock. And... Um, there was, when I found this one in Paris, we were at the Port de Clignancourt in the Pousse, back in the back, and where the real grungy stalls are. And uh, you know, you got the higher end, and if you've been to Paris hunting in the antique district, you know, you got the higher end, you get the lower end, and this was in the lower end. There's a guy down at the lower end who likes old scientific things, and he's only open a couple of days a week, and just by sheer chance, we've been hunting with Carlo Valerio and his wife. And Carlo was a wonderful friend. I haven't seen him in a long time, but he had a great lighter collector. And uh, we went to Paris, and he met us, and he took us on a whirlwind journey looking for lighters. Every time we found something, though, it went in Carlo's collection. <laughs> and, it, and I realized, you know, the truth with collectors, you know, collectors are very narcissistic. Trust me, you find something great, you know. And so it went all day in the Carlos collection, in the Carlos collection. And, and I, it, you know, it was good um, until we came to this piece. And Carlos goes, oh, oh my gosh. Well, fortunately, I spotted it first. <laughs> and I said, Carlo, no. <laughs> this one goes in my collection. And then I had to borrow the money from him <laughs> to get it because it was so darn expensive. But uh, subsequent to it, I found two more. And I've had three of these now. One's in Volker's collection. I still have the other one. And then about a month ago, one showed up at an auction in Paris, and I contacted the guy the day it was being sold, and it got sold. I don't know what he would have brought. Unfortunately, it was pretty broken. Uh, they used sulfuric acid. Dobereiner figured out, uh, he discovered that uh, catalytic reaction, like the catalytic uh, converter in your car, um, it uh, has a, a, a chemical reaction where heat, just by sheer exposure to certain materials, in this case hydrogen, and so uh, he took a, a device that had been invented many years earlier that we call Kipps mechanism now, but it made hydrogen gas by putting zinc in sulfuric acid. And you take a, a sulfuric acid solution with water and then take zinc and put it in, it'll start bubbling, and the bubbles are hydrogen. And it turns out hydrogen reacts with platinum. That's what Dobereiner discovered. And so the Dobereiner lamp started in 1823 when Dobereiner discovered this chemical reaction. And he found he could make fire. And all through this time, fire was very difficult. The tinderbox was the main staple of making fire. You had to have flint and steel and tinder. And so with the tinderbox, going back for millennia, back to the Roman days, you know, when, when Hannibal crossed the Alps, he brought his tinderbox. Jesus used a tinderbox. Those people did that, or they had wood friction, or they did that. But fire was difficult. Dobereiner came up with the, one of the first mechanisms. It predates the match. Matches were invented in 1826, when John Walker came up with the first frictional match. There were earlier matches, but they were complicated. This is one here, a miracle piece, about 1810. Instantaneous light boxing, sulfuric acid, and a match that used a chlorine of potash. Touch it in there and it would come out lit. 
that they were very dangerous and they ate holes in your pocket. So, and, you know, they were difficult. Where do you get sulfuric acid anyway? And by the time the Dobriner lamp came along, those chemicals were pretty uh, common to get. You could go to the druggist and get sulfuric acid. So the device works like this, that inside, this is lead, because lead and acid can be fine together. They don't, they don't disintegrate. Most of them are glass. And the bell jar, this one still has this bell jar intact. Usually they're busted. Anyway, a piece of zinc would be hanging in here. And then you'd fill this up with the solution and you would put this together and you'd open this valve and when you open this valve just the pressure of the liquid rises up inside here well now the zinc is suspended down inside the liquid it starts bubbling like crazy and with the valve closed the pressure builds and it starts making the liquid move down until it gets below the zinc and then it stops making gas and it says they're all charged up and in this little pill box here are some little fine filaments and if you look in there you'll see little fine filaments of platinum and the gas when you open the valve now all comes out and shoots in there and gets those little filaments hot like the catalytic lighters you know with the methane you know with the, with the, with the methyl alcohol and they glow and fire some of them have little lamps that when you uh, do that it put a little lamp in the way and it would light and light the lamp and then when you put it back the lamp stays lit that's what the clock does but it does it for you you set the time the alarm goes off, you know. Probably maybe a bishop uh, going to say mass in the morning, you know, and he sets it so that, you know, 6 a.m., he has a morning light. Mm -hmm.